Well, hello and good evening. This is Aurora with Central Coast Astronomical, and I am so excited to do some stargazing with you guys tonight. Hello! <laughs> so if this is your first time joining us, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We are going to get started in just three minutes, and we <laughs> the, the weather's looking great. We have telescopes that are lined up, ready to show you what's up in the night sky. And we also have astronomers who are in our chat right now answering your questions. So if any time during tonight's presentation which should be about 45 minutes maybe an hour but no more than that um, well we'll see <laughs> and if you have any questions as we go through go ahead and type those questions in and our astronomers will be happy to help out with that so thank you so much I already see Lee is on tonight hello thank you Dave Majors uh, oh actually I don't see Lee I see I see Dave Majors first um, and so if you can also let us know right now in the chat where in the world you are connecting from that will also help us astronomically speaking to be able to point out a couple of things we may be taking special requests tonight we'll see how how well we are doing so if you let us know where you're living maybe we can take a look and answer some of the questions that you have okay hey, so Aurora. hi Kent I, I, I'm getting Brian in but I'm not getting you on the screen oh okay no problem we are we actually are uh, let me just introduce who's talking <laughs> this is Kent with the Central Coast Astronomical Society and I actually have a picture of Kent here he is normally um, uh, our main featured astronomer who talks us through a tour of the night sky he's just gonna be on helping us out answering questions as we go through and we also have Brian let me see if I can pull Brian up let me see whoop no I made myself disappear Brian, there you are. Yes, hello. Hello. <laughs> Go ahead, I'll fix my other screen. Um, All right. So Brian is a NASA ambassador, a NASA solar system ambassador, and he is also our telescope operator for tonight. So Brian, what, um, I have a, I actually have a, uh, let me think here. I actually have a slide of you and your setup. Let me share it with everybody. Okay. Yeah, cool. so what are we, what are we looking through tonight? So tonight actually will be a different setup. I need Oops. to send you a new picture. You do need to send me a new picture. <laughs> <laughs> tonight I'll be using an Ioptron CEM 70 mount. Okay. And then a, a Celestron 8-inch telescope. It is a smith cassegrain telescope. So 8-inch telescope on a mount. So this is a tracking mount, really important for any kind of astronomy photography. And <laughs> so it's actually in my backyard here in Oak Hills, California. Okay. And I'm nice and warm and toasty in, in my office. <laughs> oh, how nice. <laughs> way to do this, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, you're actually going to get started. Oh, I messed up the screen again. There we go. Um, let me let me switch screens here just for a second. Um, we are actually going to get started with you. If you wanted to talk about what uh, we're going to be taking a look at, that would be great. Excellent. Sure. Yes. And so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Absolutely. And um, and so what we're looking at here is this is a screen showing part of the Pleiades open cluster. And this is a Messier object, which is M45. Now, uh, you'll notice we have this little donut. This is called vignetting. And this is an effect of one because it's still um, a little bit not quite fully dark yet here. And then also um, my telescope needs a little more calibration to help remove this feature. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm stretching the image. That's the native image or native view right now. And then by increasing the brightness, then I'm trying to bring up the detail on the stars. And then that also, of course, brings up the detail of anything else. Now with our view with the Pleiades tonight, by the way, that means um, the, or the name Pleiades comes from seven sisters from mythology. And this is considered an open cluster. And when um, perhaps if, I don't know if you have one handy, Aurora, but in processed images, you can yes. really make out the nebulosity, which would, means the gassy appearance of it, as well, as well as the dust that's in the area. I actually have your image here. That you okay, took. perfect. Do you see it? Yes. So I'm able to see it, and it looks like it is coming up on YouTube also. Yes, so, okay, so this is what's possible uh, with a, a processed image. And processed, uh, it is amazing what's involved in, in taking what we actually grab with our camera and making it presentable for, for the public. So this is a combination of about 20 different images each two minutes collected together, and then we run it through a program called Pix Insight. And then I do a little color touch up in Photoshop before you get the image like we, you just shared there. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, great, great. That's wonderful. So right now, this is a live image that we're seeing. Is that right? This is exactly right. So this <laughs> is my telescope actually looking at Pleiades with this uh, C8. Um, it's illustrating why we often consider Pleiades a binocular object, because I've, I've really magnified it to the point where we're only seeing part of it. Um, but our, our last show we did, uh, we did have a request for Pleiades, so I put it at the top of the list. <laughs> nice. Here. Oh, I was able to get your, your face back on, so yay! Okay, awesome. <laughs> yay, my face. <laughs> okay, I don't know if we actually saw a picture of you, like, full screen yet. Okay, great. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, and then just uh, while I'm here, I'll just mention, um, behind me for my background, this is M13, which is uh, of the uh, globular cluster in Hercules. Uh, absolutely one of my favorites. I figured uh, since this is a summer object, we could take a nice look at it now because uh, we it's behind the sun for us, so we're not really going to be able to see that too well. No, not not yet. Not this not time. Yet. Soon, not this time. Soon. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Okay, great. Oh, so what else? One thing, uh, throwing a nickel's worth here. Please yes. do. That nebulosity that is around the Pleiades. Yes. Uh, is actually the Pleiades is going through a dust cloud. Uh, one time they thought that nebulosity was involved with the Pleiades being born, but uh, now they know the Pleiades is just sailing through a dust cloud. Nice. Now, if we want That's to find cool. that tonight, um, I have Stellarium up here. I don't know how well you can see it um, because it's only half size on our screen, but we're looking kind of south, and Orion is an easy one to see. You see it here? Orion is one that most people see. Is that right, Kent? Orion's easy to see. I saw the Pleiades there, but it was just at the top edge. There we go. So if you take the three belt stars for Orion and connect the dots, you'll get this V shape. That's not quite, that's the, the bull. And if you just keep going, you'll see what most people think is the Little Dipper. Is that right, Kent? Uh, you know, I have a blank screen right now. Oh, so. Blank screen. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, so most people... I, I've got stuff on the right side, but there's no image in the uh, the central area oh, okay. of my screen. All right, um, I will, I'll see if I can fix that. But you were telling me that most people, the first time they see the Pleiades, they think it's the Little Dipper. Yeah, yeah, it actually looks like a Little Dipper. It does. And basically, I was using binoculars as a kid. And uh, I thought that was a little dipper until I got H.A. Ray's book <laughs> for the stars. And, uh, you know, the, the image that you showed on there with Orion, mm -hmm. you kind of go to the upper right, and there's the Hades. Mm -hmm. There's an orange star, and then there's that broad open cluster, which is a Hades. And then further on past the Hades, up near the top of the screen, was the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. Excellent. And it's one of the nearest uh, open clusters to us. And it's been recorded all the way back probably uh, to uh, Ptolemy or even maybe Hipparchus, oh, wow. which is way back. Wow, that is way back. All right, excellent. So, Brian, should we go back to your screen to take one more look at the Pleiades? Well, so, um, or we did you, could, you but I've moved on. <laughs> You've moved on. <laughs> you got so, <laughs> forward. <laughs> where are we going now? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to M1, okay, which is the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula. And so okay. um, right now I need to refresh my, my screen. What, uh, by the way, one of the things I'm doing is I'm using this program called SharpCap to collect individual 10-second images and then it's combining them. We call it stacking uh, so that you can have the, comb the gathered brightness without adding a lot of uh, background noise is the idea. Do you want to share and your so, screen so they can see it? Oh, that would be, uh, let's see. It is shared. It is shared. Why am I not seeing you? Okay, hang on. I can fix this. Uh, and so right now I have it stacking images so that we can pull out some more detail. Hang on a second. This looks like um, one of my programs is fighting with you. Okay, so hang on. So Zoom does not like. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Well, well <laughs> you're Kent the only can see one it. can see it, Kent. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, I'm fixing it. Kent, fixing describe it. it for the audience. No, 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 hang on. <laughs> I'll tell you, it does not look that good through an 8-inch telescope. It looks kind of like a fat S. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah, this shows the benefit of technology through an eight inch telescope. It's uh, uh, fortunately the chips that we use are much more sensitive than our eyes. Of course, our eyes can't gather light over time, right? But our camera. Can. Right. That's the, yeah. the big advantage of film or now no yes. one uses film because CCD chips are roughly 10 times more efficient. <clears throat> All right, so yes. Brian, let's, um, it thinks it's viewing your screen, but it's not. Can you- Would you like me to stop the share? Yeah, stop the share and start it okay, again. You got I it. I think that'll fix it. Okay. Okay, so I've stopped the share. Great. And then I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen again. There, there we go, we just needed to okay. kick it. Okay, go for it. All right, very good. Okay, so yes, if you bring that up now. So this, I think this works out better because uh, this is now a collection of, of 11 10 second frames. So all oh, close to two minutes. And so we can see here, we're really starting to pull out the detail of the nebulosity. And by the way, when I say nebulosity, nebula is a Latin word for cloud, really. So that's our, our official way of saying it looks cloudy. Uh, <laughs> but one of the fun things with, I find with the Crab Nebula is the colors, the reds that you'll start to pull out because of the hydrogen. And so what this is, is this is actually a star that exploded. And so when it did so, it blew out all of its contents and it's, that's now what we see uh, in, in gathering in these pictures. So we call this, uh, M1 is an example of a supernova remnant. Perfect. Kent, anything you'd yeah, like it blew, to... I think it blew up at 1054 AD. Uh, and I think they noticed it on July 4th or something like that is the, is the date there. But it was a massive star that blew, and in the center, there's a neutron star. I think it's rotating roughly 30 times per second. So it's Amazing. spinning along pretty good. It's also Messier 1. It's the first Messier object. Uh, you know, Messier made this list of nuisance objects that kind of look like comets, but didn't move. And so this was the first one he decided to record. Perfect. Very cool. Now I've yes. got, I'm showing um, Peter's uh, image now. Oh, perfect. So we can take a look at that. There we go. So Kent, uh, you probably can only see Brian right now. I, I can see you above Brian. There's like a little window that opened up and okay. has a very small image of the Crab Nebula there. <laughs> so where am I looking if I want to go see M1? What part of the sky? You, you want to go for Taurus. I, I think it's Beta Taurus. Boy, I, I'd have to look that up, but uh, it's it's the horn. Actually, you've got the bull. He's got his horns. One of his horns is shared uh, with Riga, and the next one down, I think that's maybe Beta or it may be Alpha Beta. It might be Gamma, but it's really near that bright star. I usually use that as a starting point to hop over to the uh, Crab Nebula. Oh, you, that's ex you're, I know you're not looking at a star chart right now, but you are exactly right. That's exactly where I'm looking. <laughs> yeah, so, there's yeah. like a, there's actually the bright star and then there's three other ones, makes kind of like a box. Mm -hmm. And I kind of go on a diagonal across the box and a little bit beyond it is where the crab is. Okay, right in that area. Perfect. And it's one of the brightest supernova remnants. I can't recall one that's even brighter. Yeah, I think that is the brightest supernova remnant. Oh, wow. Can you imagine what it must have been like, just, you know, based on the understanding that people had back then and how they were able to explain things, and just all of a sudden, that showed up? Yeah, it, it, they were, there were records. Uh, the Chinese recorded it. Even the Native Americans, there's like a uh, rock drawing that shows it. But people in Europe were afraid to say anything because they didn't want to end up burning at the stake. <laughs> and so there, there really isn't any European, uh, you know, records of it because I think uh, they were afraid of, you know, meeting the Inquisition. So they kept quiet, but, you know, the Chinese did a good job of recording what they called guest stars. Yeah. And it must have been amazing because that 
thing was probably as bright as a full moon. Yeah, that's a that's a really good image you have there, Brian. Oh, thank you. Uh, so do you have that back up? I do. On the screen? I do. I have awesome. your screen right now. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to, to share is that um, we estimate that the Crab Nebula is about 6,523 light years away. And so that means that these little photons left that cloud 6,523 years ago, traveled all through space, didn't run into much but besides some little bit of, of uh, what dust mm -hmm. until it finally has hit the chip on my camera so that we can <laughs> see it today. Yeah. So it's pretty amazing. Okay. It's amazing you're getting the color in there. That's great. Yes. Um, this one of the things I like with this camera is that uh, um, and this program SharpCap is it'll allow me to color correct on the fly. How many and, exposures are you taking now? I'm getting some questions about that. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so email also. Go ahead. Uh, this is uh, 40 exposures each 10 seconds, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a total of uh, just about seven minutes worth of exposure time. And when I do actual um, photography for something I'm going to process, I usually take about two-minute exposures, so it's two at a time, and I usually go for at least half an hour. Uh, but for the sake of, of um, live astronomy like this, I try to keep them short. Plus that I don't have to worry about any extra steps and guidings to keep a sharper image. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so um, if do we have any other questions before I do um, our little presentation on the DART mission? Yeah, I have um, a couple of questions. Oh, wait, you answered that. Is it a true color image? Let me see other questions. Um, here, let me put my face up. So yes, if you have questions, type them in. I know our Dave Majors and Tom Fry, and we have a number of people that are helping answer those. Thank you, thank you. Yes. <laughs> and so a couple of others, um, let's see, there is discussions going on about neutron stars. Um, <laughs> yes, that's, we have a whole side conversation. Um, <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> did you have a, Did you get an answer about the true color? Did that, uh, was that answered no, on the chart? No, I don't think it was answered. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so that's off something you'll see very common when uh, NASA and other space agencies put out astrophotos. They'll talk about if it's a true color or false color image. And that can be a little deceptive. Um, true color usually indicates, as I understand it, that that's light as we would perceive it with our own eye. Whereas when it's false color, they'll often use detectors that could even be detecting in X-ray or gamma rays, and then they bring it into our visible spectrum so that we can enjoy the detail that that represents. But something to keep in mind is even this astronomy camera, this is a, um, from the company called ZWO, this one is actually picking up into the infrared also, uh, depending on which filter I use if I block that out. So even this is showing us details that our human eyes simply cannot collect. So if I were to go outside and look through a pair of binoculars, could I see this? That's a your, good question. Your 100 millimeters would pull it in. Oh, it'd the one sitting kinda, there. It'd be kind of tough in 50 millimeter, let's say 10 F50s or 7 F50s. Okay. You know, that's, you'd have to be looking just at the right spot, have it straight overhead, and you might be able to pull it in. Okay, and I'm not going to see this color. It's going to look more like a green smudge. Is that right? It'll look like a little white smudge. White smudge. It, in my C8, it looks white. I don't see any color at all. All right. All right. Now, for the Orion Nebula, it's another story. <laughs> yes, that will be coming up <laughs> now, after I... a message from NASA. <laughs> yes, um, why don't you, why don't we, sh here, if you want to stop your screen share, we can see your face. Um, okay. And then, let's see. Well, I do have a, a slideshow for the... Oh, you have a slideshow. I'm the, sorry. Please yes. go ahead. Okay. Awesome. So let's go ahead and start this. So um, part of my, um, my privilege as a NASA Solar System Ambassador is that I get to share information about NASA missions. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to share one with you right now. And just... Not only, not only is it a very amazing and, and I think important mission, it has a great name. It's called DART. <laughs> and so DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Now with DART, um, 
This one is actually something that launched already. It launched last year, November 23rd, and last year being 2021, if you're watching this as a recording later on. And it did launch from Vandenberg, which now has the name um, Space Force Base. So this is <laughs> Vandenberg Space Force Base, which is here in California. And uh, what this is, is a planetary defense mission. In other words, they are doing experiments to see what we might be able to do to affect the orbit of an object that could be coming towards Earth, like an asteroid. Now, I do want to stress, though, that the target for this mission, which we're going to talk about in a moment, is not a threat to Earth at all. So we can do this experiment without accidentally destroying all life on Earth, for instance. <laughs> now, before we talk more about the, the mission, let's talk about the target. And the target is called Didymos. Now, Didymos actually is the name twin in Greek. And it has its own little companion, which is why we have the name double asteroid. So this is a binary system. In other words, these two giant rocks are orbiting around each other. And on the left, you can see this is an image that's drawn by artists based on light curve or photometric information. In other words, as they saw this tiny little speck of light, they measured it over time to see how it was increasing and decreasing in brightness. And they started to build these details. And then the image on the right is actually out of NASA's Eyes on the Solar System program. And this is still an artist rendition. We do not have the ability to take an image of this level of detail yet, but we will as the DART mission gets closer. Now, the pair or companion for this is called dimorphos, which means two forms. Now, I want to just let you ponder about the size of these two objects. Didymos, the larger of the two, 780 meters, or about half a mile across. Meanwhile, Dimorphos, much smaller, is just 530 feet or 160 meters. Now, when this collision actually happens, which, by the way, is the target of this, we're literally launched this mission to crash the spacecraft into, Dim uh, into Dimorphos, the smaller of the two. And the um, pair will be about 11 million kilometers, so really far from Earth. One of the questions we get is, could we see this collision in a backyard telescope? And sadly, the answer to that would be no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, let's talk a little, a couple of things I want to tell you about the spacecraft. Um, for the sake of time, we cannot go over all the amazing technology that they're employing in this spacecraft. But I do want to give you a couple of key things. I want to point out first the Draco. And the Draco is here, appears on the left image down here on the bottom. That stands for Didymos, Reconnaissance and Asteroid Camera for Optical Navigation. Now, this camera will be giving us our views of the pair of asteroids as it gets closer. And it's going to get very close. In fact, to the point to where the camera won't work anymore because it will have crashed into the asteroid. <laughs> now, they're just going to go and like give it a little push, right, and see what happens. Exactly. That is the goal. <laughs> they want to see if they can change the orbit of the smaller of the two. Right. And, and, it, so, and it's not going to put oh, anybody in danger. That's one of no, the No, not at all. Yeah, I can't nope. stress enough that yeah. not only does uh, the asteroid pair, it does not provide any kind of a threat to Earth at all. But then we're not even affecting the larger asteroid. We're hitting the smaller one. And right now, they equate the orbit to the orbital rate of Dimorphos at about the pace that a turtle walks. It takes just about 12 hours, if I'm remembering correctly, for it to go orbit around the larger of the two once. Mm -hmm. And they're hoping to maybe, if they're really lucky, change it by about 10 minutes. Right. Um, but yes, again, this is not going to alter the orbit of the pair, so there's no threat to Earth. Right. And um, the other item I wanted to point out on this is the next engine. So um, sometimes in science fiction, you hear about ion engines, mm -hmm. and that is what this is. This next engine stands for NASA, NASA Evolutionary Xenon Thruster, and, uh, and or Next C, because it's a commercial version. Now, uh, I definitely encourage everyone to look more into all the amazing technology. There's actually a lot of proof of concept technology on this mission. 
and then sadly it's going to be all crushed and destroyed <laughs> now um this we have one problem though because they're going to crash this entire spacecraft which by the way weighs just about 610 kilograms so that's 1340 pounds so this spacecraft you notice what you do not see on here, you do not see an impactor. You don't see another object that will be launched at the asteroid. This entire spacecraft is the impactor. And that is the name for the object that we crash into <laughs> another object. <laughs> uh, um, wow. th so this spacecraft, we're gonna crash all 1,340 pounds right into it. How fast so, do you think it's gonna go uh, right before That is a good question. I have that on the on an upcoming slide. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, so, go ahead. Yeah, that, but I, I definitely, um, I feel that's a very good question to answer. So put a pin in that one. Okay, I can <laughs> Stay <do that>. tuned. <laughs> now, now, so we do have an issue though, because how are we gonna be able to see what happens happens once this hits the asteroid or hits the little companion. Well, Italy has come to the rescue. Along for the ride with the main DART uh, probe, which by the way is kind of interesting because DART is the name of the mission and it's the name of the spacecraft. So on the same Falcon 9 rocket, we have, and I'm not sure how they pronounce this, so it's L-I-C-I-A or maybe Licia cube or, and that stands for light. Italian CubeSat for imaging asteroids. Now picture this, you can see by the, the scientists or engineers hands right here, it's just about the size of a, of a purse, maybe a, 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 brief a big case. purse yeah, maybe or a briefcase, brief case, I think yeah. could be a better analogy. And so um, this, this guy is going, or gal, is going to fly along and um, is going to jump ship <laughs> or, or be sure that it's, it's separate from DART when DART goes for its final plunge. And it will then observe, hopefully, if all goes as planned, the, the impact and the result. Uh, and then meanwhile, we're going to be pointing many different telescopes and radio, including radio telescopes on Earth at this collision so that we can take measurements. Mm -hmm. One of the fun things with this CubeSat is it has two special cameras named Luke and Leia. I wonder Are where- Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Where could that be from? <clears throat> and I, I, I do wonder how how much did they have to massage the acronym in order to make this come out? To make properly? it work? Oh, I don't know. So, <laughs> so it stands for uh, if if I say it as Licia Cube. Yeah. If, I hope that's correct or close enough. Okay. Licia Cube Unit Key Explorer, and then Licia Cube Explorer Imaging for Asteroid Luke and Leia. Oh and boy. so they will uh, they will take place. They'll keep an eye on that. Just to give you a comparison, this CubeSat is about 31 pounds or 14 kilogram, kilograms. Uh -huh. All right. Now, um, just two slides left. So let's share with you the, the, the plan. So if you notice what's going on, we have Dart heading in towards Dimorphos, the little the little compa or the uh, companion, and then we have Licia Cube. Keep an eye on things. DART will crash into Dimorphos, and we are hoping to change the orbit. You can see the orbital path is this white oval, and then we're hoping to impact it and affect it enough to where it, we, we change the orbit. And remember, the reason we're doing this is we're working on ideas and concepts for planetary defense so that if someday in the future, not with this object, but some future object that we discover it could be a threat to Earth, we are wonder if there will be ways for us to affect its orbit so that it would no longer hit us. Mm. Um, uh, despite uh, certain action movies from the 90s or so, <laughs> blowing up one of these would simply give us that oh. same amount of mass but hitting us as a bunch of little objects, but it still equals the original mass. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just blowing it up after sending a drill team to it will not do the effect. So we're, we're going to see what this does. No. <laughs> now, when is the impact plan to be? So that is actually this year. Mm -hmm. They're planning for the impact to, to come. They say autumn. We're looking at the end of September or the very beginning of October. Oh, wow. And one of the interesting things, you might say, well, well, Gosh, Brian, they did a lot of planning. Couldn't they know exactly when? Um, asteroids have something very fun called YORP. And uh, in addition to YORP, we have BYORP with this. Now, we get the name YORP from the scientists who put this concept together. But the sun sends out energy. And as that energy hits an asteroid, it actually causes a little bit of thrust. 
uh, Newton's laws are in effect, and it can actually affect the orbit depending on how the asteroid is turning and what's called its libido or how much it reflects. Mm -hmm. So the asteroid's orbit could change slightly within that amount of time. So we haven't mapped out exactly when they will collide, but they are crunching numbers like crazy to <laughs> see when that will happen. So our window is the end of September, possibly the very beginning of October. Mm -hmm. And so by the way, Aurora, for your very good question, yeah. we're looking at an impact speed, ready? Yeah. 6.6 .6 kilometers per second. Oh, wow. Or for us in, in, the, United in the United States, States yeah. who haven't learned metric system yet, 4.1 <laughs> Uh, miles per second. So that's slower than the space station orbits the Earth. Uh -huh. That's interesting, huh? But still very fast. It's still very fast. No, no, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, so the the velocity of this probe combined then with um, with its mass, mm -hmm. we're hoping it can affect it. Now, as my closing slide, I, I wanted to just let you know. I highly encourage you to look more into this mission. Um, mm -hmm. You can go to nasa.gov slash planetary defense slash DART, or of course you can Google DART also. Uh, but I wanna point out too, this is a mission directed by NASA, but it really is an international um, plan. Um, Italy of course contributed and uh, John Hopkins, their applied physics laboratory is the main trailblazer with this, but you can see all these other agencies on the screen. Plus, uh, the, the European Space Agency has a mission called HERA, which is going to follow up in a couple of years. And HERA will be another mission that's designed to follow on and see what the impact and um, of, no pun intended, <laughs> of, uh, of this mission <laughs> is, and then also give us more detail on this binary pair. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Right. That was really You're cool welcome. to learn about. Yeah. Right. So I, I had actually just learned about this recently where it was basically just going to go give it a push and see if we can change the orbit somehow. But I did not know that level of detail. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure to share it with you. And <laughs> so what, what my plan is then for our future shows, I, mm -hmm. I hope to and intend to highlight a certain mission for yeah, each one great. that we do. So. Absolutely, thank you. Oh, right. Now you yeah. have another telescope view that you wanted to share. I do, and so yes. I am going to head that direction right now. Okay. With, and I um, got busy talking and I had not directed my <laughs> telescope to do that, but that's <laughs> well, okay. It's okay, I can <laughs> We planned, <sh> <laughs> yeah, we, we specifically planned our, our four objects so that I could just head east as I go. So the SLU, for each one is not that drastic of a thing to do. You know. So, so what's our next object? So the next object is going to be M42, oh, or okay. the Great Nebula in Orion. Okay. And I'll go ahead and share my screen again, but I am working on capturing the image. Oh, that's um, fine. Um, I can so, show people where to find it. So Okay, that's good. Yeah, so but Orion is going to be pretty easy for people to find. Here, I can make myself bigger here. Make there we go. Orion's going to be pretty easy to find in the night sky. Here, I'll even show you. Let's go for a walk outside, you and me. Woohoo! We're going to go for a walk. We're going to go for a walk. I know, my, my computer's pretty slow doing all this broadcasting. <laughs> okay, do you see it? Yep, look for the three belt stars and zoom in here. And you can already see it. This is a, Kent, would you say M42 is a naked eye object? Not really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some people that say they can see it, but... Uh, uh, you know, I've never been able to physically see the nebulosity naked eye. With binoculars, you can, but naked eye, I've never been able to do that. <laughs> so, okay, excellent. So um, you're looking for the three belt stars, and then you're going to look for the three stars in the sword, and we're looking at that second star. And Brian actually took a picture of it. This is the picture that's with Stellarium. This is the program I'm using. Um, and so if I bring up Brian's picture here, we can, I can share it with you. Oh, actually, here's a picture from Peter Wilson. He's a CCAS club member. And here's a picture he gave. Um, I don't know, if Kent, if you can see my screen. I can see the image there, although every time I talk, that green phone thing pops up. Oh, here, okay. And, and I lose the image. There the image came back. And there it's gone again. <laughs> <laughs> here. Let me, let me see if I can pin myself for you so you can um, 
so you can see. Oh, no, it's still locked up. Brian, you're going to have to pin me um, so he can see it. There you go. Um, okay, now I'm talking and, yeah, green phone again. Okay, that's okay. Here, um, I'll talk for a second so you can take a look at it. So there's the... I guess the nickel's worth on there is the Orion Nebula's to the uh, right side. On the left side, you can actually see the horse head mm -hmm. uh, in that image. It's that little black blob sticking into that long linear uh, nebulosity there. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly right. And Paul's setup looks something like this, and he's been doing astrophotography for quite some time. So thank you, Paul. And then we had a picture from Brian. Brian's was actually on the slide. Um, Oh, no, actually, I don't have yours, Brian. I'm sorry. I have the flame and I have the horse head. No problem. So Hopefully we'll, we'll get a live one here. Let's in just get a moment. yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want to share um, SharpCap? Sure. Give me just a moment. I'm um, okay. All right. I'm so working on, uh, I had to repoint the telescope, so. No problem. So while Not Brian is doing this, I can answer the binocular question. So um, if you are interested in any of the recommendations that we have for telescopes and binoculars, we have a handout, actually not with this class, but in our monthly, when we, um, when we do the longer tours, the last page has our um, telescopes and binoculars that we recommend. Um, an inexpensive pair for 30 bucks is uh, Celestron Cometrons, and they are 7 by 50s. I wouldn't go any bigger than 10 by 50s. Um, your neck won't like it very much. <laughs> and so um, these are 25 by 100, 25 X 100. So um, the 100 is the millimeter here and 25 X is the how much bigger it is. So it's 25 times larger. So um, the larger the binoculars, obviously the more light you can collect. And um, what's really cool about these is it's 10 pounds. So it's kind of like a four to four and a half inch telescope and so I can I just leave it set up and I just go outside and, and look and it's just instant fun um, so I've really appreciated uh, having owning a pair so um, if you can write in the chat right now what is it that you are using to stargaze whether it's your naked eyeballs whether it's a telescope whether it's a set of binoculars what is your favorite thing go ahead and um, you can tell us right now we uh, we can all um, check out what each other is using at the moment for stargazing and again, if you're looking for recommendations, I wouldn't get a telescope. I would get just a pair of handheld binoculars, go outside and really just uh, take a look at the, the night sky. What would you say, Kent? Would you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you're going to start, start with a pair of binoculars. Mm -hmm. You know, once you've taught yourself enough stuff, then you can get a telescope. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I know uh, CCAS members, I know we really want to get together soon and stargaze together. That's actually how I got my start. I just started borrowing people's telescopes. I would show up and I'd look through everybody's telescope that would let me look, which is just about everybody, except for the one guy in the corner that was always doing astrophotography. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to be left alone. Um, but uh, it's a great way to get to know people as well as the night sky and, and really what you like. Um, I know when I got started, I uh, I would ask people different, like when I got my first telescope, I didn't know what eyepieces to get, so I borrowed everybody else's um, until I found the right eyepiece that was really comfortable that I enjoyed using. So how's it looking there, Brian? It's looking wonderful. Yeah, so my telescope actually had to do a meridian flip, um, oh. which means where it was pointed, even though it was just a slight move, it would have bumped the mount so it had to completely reset itself all the way around. <laughs> all right, then. <laughs> and so uh, so that's done, and I'm just stacking images. So let um, okay, me set this one control, and so I want to have the nice, uh, you know, the ooh factor or wow factor here. Absolutely, yeah. Everybody's favorite object. I think Dave Major yes, said that. Yes, this is definitely Everybody's my favorite favorite object. Favorite object. <laughs> so we have Chris Larson is using a five-inch dub, uh, always has binoculars with you. Excellent. Uh, Richard, naked eye or binoculars. My telescope is in the attic. Oh, my. Uh, Julianne's dad, 10-inch, uh, my dad's 10-inch Dobsonian. So that's my daughter. <laughs> oh, that is your daughter. I was going to yes. say. <laughs> Yeah. Was... Okay, so your 10 inch Dobsonian, yes. and she still has her binoculars. Good job, Dad. Yes. Um, 
<laughs> Favorite is a 15 by 70 millimeter Celestron Skymaster handheld. This works good for me. Good job, Harold. Um, let's see. Dave is using a 14 inch dub. I have a picture of Dave Majors. Dave, I'm going to share it whether you want me to or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're in here, but it's your old Dobsonian, so we'll just do it for old time's sake. And so we have Dave Majors there. He is, um, he's doing a lot of, you're doing some amazing work on astrophotography, Dave, so good job. Um, okay, let's see who else do. Oh, are you ready? Just tell me when you're ready to. Yes, I'm ready. Oh, well, let's shoot you. Ready, set, go. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, here we have it. Here's the Great Nebula in Orion. Okay. And Ooh, everybody so, at the same time. Ready? Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. So, right, so this, uh, as, as is uh, often shared, this is what we considered a star forming region. So in other words, there are new stars being born right inside here. And you can see that then the energy that those stars are putting out is blasting out the dust and gas that's around here. And so we could see just with this image, we're starting to really pull in some of the reds. Uh, that comes a lot from the hydrogen. And um, what's neat is depending on the wavelengths of light that you observe the Rhine Nebula, you'll start to see different amounts of details. And so right now, this is just about two minutes worth of, uh, worth of exposures right here. And one of the things I thought I might try with this one is I actually have a separate filter mm -hmm. that only allows um, H alpha and oxygen three. So two, with the, that refers to two wavelengths of light that are put out by hydrogen and oxygen. And the focus will be slightly off, but I think it could bring in some neat details to share. Absolutely. So as soon as we finished enjoying this, then we can take a look. Now, do, is it you know, Brian, uh, also you can see, uh, you know, on the left, is M42, but on the right, that little round with the bright star, that's M43. So that's the other uh -huh. part there of the Orion Nebula. And on your image there, uh, it's interesting. When I look at it in my 20 inch, I see green around the central bright area there. And then there's like a muddy orange that I can pick up visually, mm. which you can kind of see that linear portion you got the three stars up and down, and there's like angled off as like a uh, a wall there. And uh, in the 20 inch, I can pick up as a kind of a muddy brownish, orangish color. So you can actually see some of the color in that in my 20 inch. Yeah, this is one of those definitely fan favorites for any kind of public outreach. But then even for experienced uh, viewers, we still enjoy uh, moving our scope over to this one and just drinking it all in. <laughs> definitely. And you can Oh, see yeah, this there's amazing detail at higher magnification. Mm -hmm. I remember I was at the California Star Party one time at like 3 o'clock in the morning, and Orion was coming up decently. And you could see holes in the nebulosity, little pits uh, near the trapezium, which is pretty close in the center there. Just totally awesome, plus all the wispiness uh, to the nebulosity. So it's always a beautiful object. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. And yeah, just a reminder, this is a, a live view, quote unquote live view. In other words, we gathered these photons just now. Of course, the photons left this region about 1,344 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we had the question pop up just recently. This is M42 or the Great Nebula in Orion. So and we're, then, we're getting a qu um, questions about, is it a star that's blowing up? Is it new stars are being formed? Oh, right. What's happening here? Yes, new stars are being formed here. So this would be considered a star forming region. And that's one of the uh, things that can be confusing when you hear the term nebula, then there are different causes for the nebula. Sometimes it's simply a collection of dust and gases um, that are being illuminated sometimes by stars that are near the region. Um, next month, we'll probably share the horse head and the flame, which I have on, on my profile picture there. But in this case, stars are being formed and we showed you tonight M1, or the Crab Nebula, and that's a different example for a 
a nebula where that's from a supernova or a star exploding. So we've seen both sides of the life of a star now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this Orion Nebula is actually a blister in a really big molecular cloud. There's this great big cloud that we can't see, and this is the place where the stars have blown a hole in the uh, in the molecular cloud. Actually, the the radiation pressure has ripped the hole, and it's like a little blown out blister in this great big cloud. Very wow. Cool. It's, uh, all right, awesome. So shall we go for our, our final planned object? Absolutely. Why don't you all go right. ahead yeah. and slew on over there? And while you okay, are, I will, I will share with you a quick a little, um, quick little thing. So we are good at finding the Orion Nebula. Most people can find that pretty easily. So this is the star forming region. So you have the belt and then you drop down. Here is where we were just looking at down there. What's really interesting is if you take these three stars and connect them until you see the Hyade cluster um, in here, these are stars that, um, well, actually, here, let's just keep going to the Pleiades. This is the first object that we talked about before. This is an open star cluster. And these stars are slowly drifting apart. And about this, this, these are about six times older. And these are stars that have already drifted apart. And these are brand new stars. So in this one area of the sky, you can see all three, um, really all three stages of, of stars, which are here, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, let me see. We are our next object. Oh, we got a lot of questions coming in. Thank you, astronomers. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for helping us get all of the questions answered. I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, we have, um, let's see, we have... <laughs> We have a lot of people who own telescopes and it lives in your car. That's fantastic. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so we're just going to share one more object. And if there's something special that you would like to see, could you put it in the chat right now? And if it's something we're able to show you, we'd love to. If it's something that's up, if it's something that Brian can get to and his house or his trees aren't in the way. <laughs> so go ahead and put something in the, in the chat if you are interested in having us show it to you while he is working on his last object. And I can share with you the actual uh, picture that a club member shared of this last object. And this is um, here. Hey, Kent, if I tell you the actual, the NGC number, could you tell me what it is? Uh, NGC 2237. That's got to be the rosette or part of the rosette. There's actually a bunch of NGC numbers <laughs> tied into it because it was hey. discovered piecemeal. But I think that's one of the rosette numbers. You're exactly right. We're going to take a look at the rosette nebula. And this is a picture here uh, that Peter, whoops, sorry, that Peter had shown. Let's see, where did it go? Um, Peter had taken. Peter Bressler is uh, one of our members, our CCAS members. And I think this is his older setup. He has, um, I think he has a plane wave now. Um, he has a different telescope and wires everywhere, of course. And he's got a, a shed that rolls uh, over it and then you push it back so it's on little rails down here and he's done amazing work he is self he said he's self-taught in like a year or two if that's right so thank you peter you did a beautiful job on these images and i'm gonna come and check in on brian how you doing brian i'm good my telescope has slewed okay and so i am just uh working on seeing if, if i can bring it out yeah if with this one um, you know, I was a little ambitious with bringing up this object <laughs> as the moon is just about getting ready to rise. So I'm just uh, gathering a few more stacked images to see if I can pull out some of this. Yeah. And in fact, when we told Kent we were going to do this, the first thing Kent yeah. said was, uh, you do know there's a moon out, right? And we said, <laughs> yes. well, I think, I think we can get it in before the moon rises. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so uh, we could, I'm happy to share my screen and I can show uh, what, what we do to develop. Yeah, go oh, ahead. Oh, actually, you're my on. screen is shared. Yep, so you're on. Okay. <laughs> so um, basically, you're starting to see some nebulosity right down here in the lower portion of the screen. And so if I reset my view, this is what the native view looks like without um, any stretching or increasing the brightness of the, the details in the image. And so if I just start to bring this up, then we, um, we can try to pull out some detail. And then, of course, I need to color correct. 
Uh, but one of the things when you're working with these cameras is they're sensitive to certain colors more than others. And so that causes us to um, have a color imbalance, but fortunately the programs will let us correct it. So I think this is starting to look like it's getting washed out. And so I bet you that we're starting to get the moon in here. It's looking good. Do you do you want okay, me to there. stay on so, stay on you or do you want me to talk? Let's see. I think we can we could just stay here. So okay, I'm um so hey, Brian, yeah, I started... is, it, is it actually pointing in the right direction? Because usually for the rosette, there's like six stars that right. you know, I two, think four, we've six got the in edge. the center. We've got the edge of, of it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to realign my camera. And so you know what what probably happens also is technically the NGC that I went after is probably on the edge. So I can move my my camera, you were pointing out that it has more than one NGC number. Yeah, it has a bunch of them. As, so, as different people found different sections, they well, kind of added it together. I think once they got photography, then they saw it was like a big ring. Well, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to just one one second exposures, and then I can control my camera a little bit this way. And I'll see if I can recenter it a little bit more in a direction that will work for us. Oh, so Kent, here's a question. Can we see a galaxy that was in an old sci-fi movie? I think it's the one you mentioned last time. Do you remember off the top of your head? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, what was that about a galaxy? Do you remember the galaxy you pointed to at the end of our show last time? Oh, yeah. Um, I think it was, what, 891 or something like that. It was the Outer Limits Galaxy. The Outer Limits Galaxy. Yes, that's right. Okay, there you go. You answered one of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And Dave Majors popped up the answer, too. Excellent. <laughs> there, Wonder it looks like we're getting towards the center at the bottom. Yes, I'm starting to see those. Yay. There's like six stars that are arranged two, two, and two. And that makes up the uh, the central area of the uh, rosette. And it's actually those those stars there are what's blowing the hole in the circular nebula. So I'm going to work on bringing these more into the center of the field, and then I'll go back to stacking, and we should get a better view. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it should build up the nebulosity that's around this. But that's the center is those two, four, six stars that are relatively bright. And if you haven't liked or subscribed to our channel, maybe now would be a good time. <laughs> and <I agree. laughs> so here we go. I've also put in the chat um, Stellarium, which is the link to the free planetarium software when I was pointing out different constellations. Um, and where things were, so you can download that. You can use a web-based version. I think there's an app on the phone. Um, I use Sky Safari, but there's a lot of them out there. Um, let's see, other questions? I think you got it pretty well centered there, okay. Brian. Yeah. All right, I will let that set settle, and then uh, we'll go back to 10 second exposures. Reset my colors here. Are you guys, um, so not you guys, um, you guys keep going, uh, but audience, are you finding it useful to watch Brian as he is setting and taking images? Is it useful for you to, to see this process? I thought, I thought it would be, but if you can give us feedback on what you are enjoying tonight, that would be great. We would love to hear from you. No, oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One yes. thing that's interesting about the rosette is it has a very good O3 response. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I'll take my big 2-inch 32-millimeter eyepiece and screw a 2-inch O3 filter mm -hmm. onto the back of it, and it really makes the whole nebulosity stand out. In fact, you can see dark lanes running through the nebulosity oh, wow. using an O3 filter. Yeah, so if I get there really it is. aggressive, there it is. <laughs> so we're even pulling out some red here. So you see, if I'm really aggressive with my stretch, <laughs> then we can get it. 
you can see the dark lanes also yes. running That's in the nebulosity here. up near mm -hmm. the top there. Cool. Some, something else I noticed too, I have a little donut down close to the bottom and that is the moonlight coming in the side of my light tube and then hitting the mirror. Oh. oh. So we're on borrowed time. <laughs> At least definitely for this side of the sky. <laughs> Still, it's pretty good to pull it in with, uh, you know, interference of moonlight right now. Yes. Especially with the moon being so bright so, and big. So speaking of, of oxygen three and hydrogen, let's flip filters. And okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clear this stack. Now, when you change filters, you have to refocus because the light path has been altered. And I have not set up a motorized focuser yet, but I tested this last night and the focus is pretty close. Um, so, and I think it's worth it to bring up. So now we've, we're blocking out most light and we're just allowing a couple of small bandwidths through that come from hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. And so then we will see, uh, we're regathering new, uh, a new stack here and we'll see what we can do to bring this out. So Kent, we have a question about if it's visible with binoculars. Uh, you know, the, the group of stars is, the nebulosity, I would say uh, no, unless you wanted to cheat and put a, let's say your 100 millimeter binoculars mm -hmm. and put filters on that, you might be able to pull it in, but not your typical, you know, 750s or, or 10 by 50s. Uh, you won't actually see the nebulosity. You'll just see the six stars that are kind of in the center. Ah, okay. So just to, as a reminder, here's a picture that was taken, I think maybe a month or two ago by Peter. Um, and I know it's a black and white image, but I was amazed at how much detail was in there. Was that an H alpha picture? Mm, I have to go back and look. I'm not sure. Okay, because it's just such, it stands out so well in that image there. It might be. But I was thinking maybe, oh, wow. Brian's image is looking pretty nice. And so people are asking about the colors, pink, purple, green, what's going on? Right, and and so that's, <laughs> what, <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and so what's happening is, I'm working on fine tuning red, green, and blue, either adding or subtracting them to try to bring out the colors we should see and subtract the background noise mm -hmm. and the background light that we're getting for the sun. So for you, I could blow out red like that. <laughs> and we're trying to get as natural as an appearance is what I'm really after. Okay. Um, so here we can see, um, you know, it, this is, we're really just getting a lot of vignetting, which is, is part of the calibrations that I will work on for next time for the telescope. And so, yeah, Still, but, that's um, pretty darn good for, you know, with the moon coming up. Yeah. Yes. And, and so what we would look for is without, uh, with some better settings and adjustment. And of course, when it's processed, then we take out this, these white corners that you see here now. And so in the sky where we're looking is if you recognize Orion here and here are the belt stars, and this is M42. Um, if we're going the opposite direction here, and this is where we're looking at the rosette right in there. So this is just the stock or the, the image that they have. Yeah, Aurora, I usually start at uh, How do you find uh, it? Beetlejuice, the slide over for Beetlejuice. Right okay, so you start which here. Which is the upper shoulder of Orion. Okay, so you start here and you slide over. Oh, it's a, almost the same distance. Look at that to get to the rosette. Okay. That's, That's a little bit easier, uh, you know, yeah. to, to get in that general area. Yeah, there's nothing else really bright around there. Huh. Okay. And so let's see, we have questions about, oh, we have a lot of questions about the sun. Thank you everyone for answering those. <laughs> and, um, is our sun gonna turn into a rosette nebula? Uh, just the opposite. <laughs> our, our sun was born in something like a rosette nebula. Uh, perhaps uh, 10 billion years from now, it may form a planetary nebula. And that'll look entirely different than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And let me see about other questions. 
uh, astronomers, again, thank you so much for helping out, um, Tom and uh, Dave and everyone. Thank you for helping answer questions. And other, let's see, Brian, did you have anything else you wanted to, to uh, oh, I'm, you're gone. There you are. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so wonderful. So how'd you guys like that? We're kind of at the top of the hour. How, how did you find it? Go ahead and let us know in the chat. This is the first time we've really done this. Just kind of had an informal, hey, we're going to stargaze and we want to take you with us and let's just talk about it um, experience. And we were wondering if you would like to do this again, maybe next month. So let us know in the chat what you think. And we would love, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. <laughs> so um, let's see, other questions that came up. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I know that the thing at the top disappeared. I don't know why. Um, it, <laughs> we are Central Coast Astronomical Society, and we normally get together in person, <laughs> and we get to um, enjoy the night sky. And part of our mission is to share that excitement and enthusiasm with community. And so actually starting in... Um, March of 2020, we started to do monthly stargazing with both Kent and uh, Brian. You came on board, I think, a month later. And so we we definitely have been doing, uh, we've been doing monthly. We've now switched formats. We were thinking that this would be a better format because it's a lot of work to do these live shows. Um, and so maybe having a, a once a quarter with Kent, uh, giving us a tour of the night sky, but then um, maybe every month having something similar to this where we just get to stargaze and take a look. Um, yeah, and so um, it was something specific. Is it useful for me to point out to you where things are um, having this set up as we're talking or or so dot, dot, dot. So let me know what your feedback is. We'd love to know. Uh, Kent, did you have any last things you wanted to? I've got a question for Brian. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, I mean, this may be stupid, but uh, <laughs> uh, can you put the scope on Cirrus right now? I did, and yes, I have it there now. You do. I, I'm just curious if you can see yeah. anything uh, uh, the because uh, we got moonlight coming up. The it, the problem is the seeing. So since I don't have any adaptive optics. <laughs> oh, okay. That's yeah. You got to have good seeing to try and pull yeah. in the the white so, dwarf. Yeah. So so here it is right here. So this is serious. And um, can you share with this Kent what you're what you mean? Because you're talking about the pup, right? Yeah, the pup is, you know, in close, uh, but right now it's got the best separation it's going to have in like 80 years or something like that. And, and so this so, is a star that's orbiting the main one that we see, right? right but it has an elongated orbit? It's it's a, uh, I think it's an 80-year orbit, and uh, it's got the best separation right now. It's elliptical, uh, and I was just curious if the scene is bad, you're not going to pull in the pup. You got to have good scene because it's in quite close. Uh, the the <laughs> real problem is Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, mm -hmm. and so that brightness really kind of blows away uh, the poor pup there. Yeah, but, too. Uh, now, what's interesting is if as as I tweak with my settings. You notice that every single exposure, these are these are just f almost five millisecond exposures. Every single one of them looks different. And for everyone watching, that's because the light coming through our atmosphere is being slightly bent in different directions every time. Now, one astrophotographer actually used this as a trick and then collected hours of footage and was able to pick individual frames that caught the pup. And, but you notice that sometimes it looks like it's just a splat. And what we would hope to see is one little dot off in one specific location. We're not getting that. <laughs> I remember when I first saw it in the 20 inch, it was March. And I used that technique of, you know, waiting until it was still kind of light out uh, to go after mm -hmm. it. But I still went home and verified that, that what I thought was the pup was in the right position. I believe it's like straight east of uh, mm. Cirrus. And uh, so I verified, yeah, the position angle uh, was correct. So that's another thing that you have to do <laughs> to make sure you really got it or not. Yeah. 
Now, I, I had a couple of questions about what's up in the night sky. How can you tell? You can use Stellarium, which I had been showing during the class. And for those of you who have a subscription to Sky and Telescope magazine, if you don't, you might want to look into it because in January they give you uh, a, a chart that I really enjoy that uh, is not nearby. Wait, I have it. <laughs> and that goes on your wall. Um, and so they give you this chart. And so just by looking across, you can tell uh, which planets are up. There were a lot of questions about which planets were available and stuff. It's called the Sky Gazer's Almanac, and they make it for different uh, latitudes and so forth. So that would be something that Aurora, I would they also, I believe, they sell that at shop. What is it? Shop uh, at Sky or something. Yeah, it's yeah, like, shop at sky it's like six dollars. Yeah, they're pretty inexpensive, and they also give it to you in digital format, which I have here. So here's a, let me share. So here it is in digital format as well. Um, if you have the magazine subscription, it's the last couple of pages. And so you could see like going across here, we can see, oh, Mercury sets, you know, mid-July. And then Neptune rises and Jupiter rises and Mars is rising. This is a good night to be up to take a look at planets. Um, <laughs> yeah, look at Mercury at the uh, yeah the end of April, was it end of May end or of no, May. March, end of March. Uh, end of March, here we'll go up. Uh, end of March. For the Mercury. evening. In or no, it isn't March. It's safe. My, I keep losing the image when I talk. That green phone oh, pops up. Here, um, Brian, I don't know if you can uh, pin me um, for him. So you, you are pinned. I am? I guess maybe. Uh, uh, <clears throat> here, if I talk, then Kent, can you see it? We'll, we'll talk. Yeah, there you. it there is. There you go. There, okay, yeah, right there. And so, right there, you can see how high the peak is. Yeah. At the what end of April or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it was the end of April, beginning of May, and the peak is right there. And so you're going to be able to see it when it's really dark, and that's pretty cool. And you can see it's in the dark part of the sky versus mm -hmm. the lighter blue. Yes, yeah, very true. And so normally this thing is um, darker, like it's it looks like it's got a, an hourglass shape because in the summer you've got shorter nights, in the winter you've got um, uh, longer for 40 degrees north latitude. So anyway, so that's something that is uh, also fun to add to your collection of astronomy things that you get to yes. collect. <laughs> All right, let me uh, take a look here. One more, um, let's see, uh, any other questions? Yes, so Central Coast Astronomy, you don't have to be a member. We'd love it if you are. You don't have to be a member. Um, but if you are, we take members worldwide. <laughs> so we love your support. We also have a store where you can buy things. Brian, you set that up, didn't you? Yes, yeah. did, right. And you can we have, uh, go ahead. We have shirts and all the well, and so it's shirts, coffee mugs. Two important things you need: t-shirts and coffee mugs. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but all of the astrophotos are from club members that you'll yeah. find on all the different objects. So you can pick like your favorite astrophoto, and then pick what mm -hmm. you want it on, and then they'll make it yes. for you. So, and mm -hmm. which is really cool. And then you go to support us, so we can do things like this for free. <laughs> and mm -hmm. did you notice there's no ads during this presentation? Yeah. So, this is this is important to us that we get to share. Yay! Our, yay! <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> to share astronomy with you. Um, okay, so if you had a question that didn't get answered, please, you can, um, I know my email got jammed, so I wasn't able to check questions. I don't know, Brian, if you can, but um, I, it got I haven't, haven't received a notification for any email questions, okay. actually. So I was gonna say, after this is done, um, you can email just questions at centralcoastastronomy.org. Um, you can also text that number at the screen. Even if you're watching the recording, it will turn it in, don't call, there's nobody there. It will turn your text into an email and shoot it over to questions at Central Coast Astronomy. And so we'll be able to answer those questions as well. And so other um, other last minute things, would the chart be useful in Australia? So you'll wanna get the, the Southern Hemisphere one. So the one that is closest to your latitude of where you live, I think they don't do it for every latitude. It's like 30, 40, 50, somewhere in there. Um, so I, I actually uh, got one of those for Australia when I went down there in like 1999. <laughs> and? Uh, and it's funny because instead of being a narrow waste during our summer, mm -hmm. it's, you know, their winter. So it actually starts narrow and gets fat in the center and then narrows down the other end because their seasons are reversed. Yes, here I actually I have it here. Um, let me let me get the one for Australia. Uh, give me just a second. Sorry. 
There we go. So yeah, depending on where you live, shop at Sky Almanac. Oh, maybe I should just share what I'm doing so you can see it. Here, I'll make myself big. Um, and you can see, oh, here's the, here's the fat one. Oops, but make sure you get it for the current year. That one's for 2021. That's why it's only $3. Um, so it got fatter <laughs> in the, um, yeah, in the June, July, because that's where their nights are longer. So yeah, and so you can find it. it. Looks like they might be out of stock. They were in stock yesterday. I bought one yesterday for a friend. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, and and 50 degrees north. Isn't that interesting? You don't actually get. You notice those poor guys never get a <laughs> uh, a night I know. during uh, like June into July. It's always light out. Yeah. That is pretty wild. <laughs> Say, Aurora. Yes. I have a bonus object if you'd like. <gasps> yes. You guys want I a bonus object? I have the planet object? Uranus. No way. Oh, let's take a look. Let me make you full screen. There you go. It's all yours. All right. All right. Here we go. So, yep. Here is the planet Uranus. And so you can see the, the slight color hue towards the, the blue. It's part of how, how I know I'm on the right object. But notice something else. Hmm. Notice that there's no flicker. And this is a really good illustration. So by the way, you can notice I'm, I'm adjusting the exposure and you can see how it's unevenly lit, which is what we expect, expect because of the clouds or the, the surface features, so to speak. But um, the, you'll notice that when you look up at the night sky, twi <laughs> twinkles, <laughs> stars often twinkle as that pinpoint of light comes through the moving air. Wow. But with a planet, it's, a, a, it's called a wider angular size. In other words, it has a little bit of width and that helps the light come in and be a little more steady. So if you notice certain objects not twinkling as much, that possibly could be a planet. Wow. And that's where like your, your guides that you were pointing out can help you know if you're actually looking to where there, there is a planet. Just to let you know, this is quite magnified. This is what it looks like without the native view. <laughs> and it's part of why I love this camera, because of its higher resolution, I've got some, uh, some pixels to play with. Yeah, I mean, that's always yeah. the question, right? What am I looking at? Did I get yes. it? Is that it? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> hey, Brian, one yes. of your images, instead of looking bluish, actually looked green. It was like a smaller image that popped in for a second. And it's funny, when I look at it through my 20-inch, hmm. it actually looks like a little green disc for Uranus. Oh, okay. Where yeah, and, and that's there, probably when I'm tweaking the exposures and dropping it down, because I, I think I am washing it out a little bit. Where, you know, it's funny, Ur or, uh, Neptune actually looks blue. So there's a, a color difference visually uh, uh -huh. for the two planets, uh, you know, uh, Neptune versus Uranus. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right. Well, wow, good. I awesome. thought that'd be a nice grand finale for the bonus object. Yay! Yeah. That's great. <laughs> this was fun. I totally think we need to do this again. Yes, I agree. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, we are going to say good evening and good night. I hope you go outside now, look up, and have fun. Remember, what are the four objects we did? We did the rosette. Oh, you guys have to help me. We did M42. Yep. What? What else did we do, Kent? Crab Nebula, M1. Chem oh, that's M1 right. and, and, and 45. And 45 should 45. be visible, even though we also look at the moon. Yes, the it's moon just will be real pretty. Up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the moon through binoculars is one of the biggest wowzers people have the first time they look. So the moon, we're not talking about anything else, just the moon through binoculars. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all right, everyone. It's, it's not Bye. hard to miss either. <laughs> <laughs> right, sure. actually yeah that's a really good point the first time you look you'll learn whether you look too high or too low i always look too low so it was a good way to train myself to where i think it is and then just move it up a titch just uh just to just to get used to it so yay mm -hmm. all right everyone i will we'll see you next time brian do we have a date for the next one or we do we do yes what uh, is i'll it? need to it's uh because that's that'll be march Oh, and so that'll be part of our March adventures yes, with supercharged we, science. We do. <laughs> um, I actually wrote it down. It's and so see if I can, we're all scrambling for I'm our racing. I'm racing you to get yes. it. Okay, It'll be on a Friday and that will be the 25th, March 25th. Yes. At 8 p.m. though. 8 p.m. Exactly. Yeah. That pesky time change that is time going change. to make things adventurous. <laughs> Not to mention the, the earth being slightly tilted different. So our days are getting longer. 
<laughs> so many things to think about. All right, yes. so the 25th at 8 p.m., we will see yes. you next time. And by the way, it's another really good reason to follow us on YouTube and to subscribe to our email uh, mail list because then we send out announcements for these free events. Mm -hmm. Yes, and whoops, I'm sorry, I made you disappear for a second. <laughs> there you That's are. All right. I will take it personally. <laughs> all right, well, thank you, Kent, for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Yes, thank and you, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, I'd be really lonely here without you. So, just the three of us. <laughs> so, thank, thank you, everyone. you, Aurora. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you next time. Bye bye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye bye.